So I wanted to show you some really cool stuff just in general. Um, so I wanted to, I have had a lot of people say like, so closures and stuff, what do we compare to everybody else? So a whole bunch of my teacher friends have this like thing that they had put together. So this is all the states in the United States and where everything is closed till. So everything that's in blue is the ones that are closed until further notice. All the red ones are the ones that have not closed and all the bold ones are shut down for the rest of the year. And if you want like a little bit of a better source, you can see right here how Utah compares to everybody else. It's kind of hard though, because most of the blue states that are our color blue are actually closed until like May 15th-ish um, compared to us that is only for May 1st. So just something interesting um, that you can be able to see. So hopefully, wait, go back. Okay, there you go. Um, so while you guys are looking at this or whatever, what I want you to do, if possible, is hopefully you realize that if you go to the day by day in the, um, the Canvas course, you can click on today's day, which is Origins of the Cold War. And hopefully you guys had a chance to see this because I got to switch off. Um, I'll show it later, though, or maybe I'll send it out. But if you go to the day by day and you go to this one right here, it'll end up looking like this. And I don't like that. Why is this here? <sighs> okay. Uh, and then you can see right here, so the Zoom link, which is one that you're already in. And then the PowerPoint is the one I'm about to pull up. The notes. Um, if you click on the notes right here, then you can be able to like file and make a copy. And then you can basically have open your um like if you want to highlight make notes whatever it could be it's being really slow right now which i'm assuming is because i'm screening with like a hundred of you guys um but this is the notes that you would want to be able to have for like the quiz and it still has a connect the dots right here if it ever ends up loading up um and then overall just things to keep in mind we'll talk about this practice quiz a little bit later this is the assignment that you already had due, which is due on Monday. That's a little bit of a change um, for some people because originally it was Monday, Tuesday, but now since we're not coming back. And then just one thing to keep in mind about this not so typical is that I am going to allow you that if you did your board game to submit that as well. So you can either do a not so typical on period seven or you can do your board game assignment that we had already talked about before. And then your one pager is going to be due on April 6th. So just keep those in mind as well. Any questions before we start today? other than people sharing National Park Service pitch. Okay, cool. Well, then I would just go ahead. So if we did the board game, yes. So if you did the, not the extra credit board game. So if you did the extra, the board game assignment, well, okay, here's the deal, guys. We don't have any guarantee that we're coming back on May 1st. Um, we just have no idea what's going to happen. And so the reason why I'm saying that you can turn in your board game is because that gives the opportunity for people who did do the assignment to not have to do the project. So then you would just turn it in right here. Is that clear? So if you have the board game, yes, you don't have to do the not so typical, you just turn it in here as long as it's not your extra credit assignment. We're all good now? Okay, cool. Uh, do I think the chances of us coming back are high? I will go off of the district and the state that says we are coming back on May 1st. Um, however, I think it really depends on the next two weeks. Um, uh, I think that the national guess, I think they said, is there's like a 30% chance that everybody comes back. We just have no idea, which is why if you go back to this, you know that there are um, four here, and I'm actually aware of three other ones that are also going to close for the rest of the year that aren't highlighted yet on here. So, um, yeah. Uh, FRQ thing is due on Tuesday. I'll explain that later. And then I think we're good. Can everyone from your board game use it for the not so typical? Yes, as long as they were working on the board game. Okay, uh, but we're all going to be just fine. This way. Yes. I thought the national history competitor get like. No, you. Well, yeah. So if you did an HD, just message me to remind me, and I'll excuse you from that. From from the not so typical. Yeah. Yay. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, so we're going to get started today. So hopefully you have opened that. Uh, we will talk about Trump later. Um, so we are going to be doing actually a lesson I'm really excited about, which I know I say that like all the time. Uh, but and so again, as you can see that it, when it comes up, I'm not going to have access to the chat. So if you have a question, just unmute yourself and then we'll kind of go from there. 
Uh, but I'm excited because now that we don't have to worry about periods eight and nine on the exam, we can do what we want. So I'm actually gonna kind of go off of what AP wants me to do, and I'm just gonna do what I feel like doing because it's way more fun than what they want me to be able to do. So hopefully you find this pretty interesting because we're gonna go off of that. Um, before we start though, I want to show you guys some interesting things. So if you wanna compare A push to what we're learning in class, you guys might have seen um, when, you guys might have seen this. You guys remember when we talked about before with World War II about how everybody mobilized for the war effort? So that's actually happening right now. So one of the biggest things they need are ventilators. So a bunch of car companies, since nobody's buying cars right now, um, are converting to create the ventilator systems. And then, uh, actually this one first. Um, interesting thing too, so a bunch of whiskey distilleries are now converting to make hand sanitizer because it's the easiest way to be able to convert. And I've also seen other ones where like clothing companies are now making masks and things like that. So really interesting. And then if you want another good relation to today, uh, is the fact that they're actually having bank runs. And this is what's happening um, in the last two weeks, especially yesterday. The FDIC came out and said, don't withdraw your money. There was a bank in New York for like really high profile people that ran out of $100 bills and $50 bills um, because they had so many people. I think they said they withdrew over $3 million in a single hour at this New York bank because people were freaking out. So um, FDIC actually came out yesterday and said, don't do a bank run because that's going to lead us to exactly what happened in the Great Depression. So, you know, interesting fact. Uh, but anyway, so moving on from that, we're going to go into the Cold War. Uh, so the Cold War was basically this confrontation between the U.S. and the USSR. Um, and it really was this massive period of just fear, anxiety, and all those different things going on. So make sure that you know it's between the U.S. and the USSR. Um, don't put Russia, because Russia does not exist again until 1989 when the Berlin Wall falls. Um, I think it's actually technically 1991. Uh, so make sure you know that it's the USSR or the Soviet Union, whichever works best for you guys. So we talked about um, the League of Nations after World War I. And when the League of Nations failed, the UN was successful. So some of these things are things that you already did on your homework assignment. So hopefully this is like review for you guys. Um, but basically what happens is they create a brand new organization, which is the UN, which is going to be so much more powerful than what they did before. So this is what the UN looks like today. So all of the nations, so you can see, um, I don't know if I can move this on the right hand side, you can see that the United States is one of the very early ones to be able to do. Um, and then you can see that a whole bunch of countries have joined later as well, but almost all countries are a member of the UN. And I hear a lot of times people are really confused by, for example, Russia. So why is Russia there when we don't like Russia? If you actually look, why isn't it working? There it is. Um, down here at this U.S. Secure, or the Security Council. So these five nations are what are called the Security Council. So each of those nations are people who um, had lost a bunch in World War II. And because of that, they actually have the most power, China being probably the most um, surprising. And that's mostly because of the fact that um, they had been attacked by Japan. So they had some things come out of it. Um, but all these countries are the Security Council, which means no matter what happens, if a single one of these disagrees with something in the UN, then it can actually um, be completely uh, denied. So that's part of the problem with, like, for example, Russia is all these other ones can say yes, but as soon as Russia says no to something, so for example, they tried to make it illegal to imprison people who were um, LGBTQ, and Russia denied that, which resulted in it not being passed in the Security Council in the United Nations. Uh, Zimani, I hear a lot of like beeping. Hopefully, if you have a question, you can ask me. I can't see. Okay, uh, so the Yalta Conference is really important. Make sure you know Germany when it comes to the Yalta Conference. So this happens like four months prior to the end of um, World War II. And basically what they're going to decide is what should happen with Germany. So all of these things down here, the major points are the things that are going to happen. Colin, do you have a question? Um, I was just getting into the lecture because uh, I just uh, couldn't join with video because it said it had a uh, hundred people max. Oh, so you can join with audio too? Yeah, you can join with audio. Oh, cool. I didn't know you could join with audio over a hundred people. So that's helpful to know. Um, well, yeah. welcome. 
Uh, yeah, we hit 100 people, so it'll be video too if you want to go back and watch the video itself. Mm. Okay. Just make sure you mute yourself um, unless you have a question or something like that. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, so the biggest one that I would know is this very first bullet, that Germany is split into four occupation zones. So basically what that means is that Germany gets split into four different areas um, based on the four major allied powers. So they have the USSR over here, United States, the UK, and France. And all of these end up combining into one big Germany. So this becomes West Germany, and this becomes East Germany over here. Now, if you notice this little itty-bitty place right here, anybody want to unmute themselves and tell me what place uh, that is? Berlin. That's Berlin. Good job. Uh, good job, Miles. So this is Berlin, and it gets split into four occupation zones as well which ends up getting split into two, which is East and West Berlin. Um, and we'll learn about why it's a problem in just a second. So Berlin gets divided into four different areas, um, and it gets separated in particular by the Berlin Wall. Now, the Berlin Wall does not start until the 1960s. So basically, it started as just you could go freely back and forth between East and West Berlin without any issues. However, over time, it becomes the famous Berlin Wall. The wall started in the mid-1950s, um, and it was only about two feet tall. So it was no big deal. It was just, hey, this is a barrier between the two. However, as tensions get higher and higher and higher, it ends up getting higher and higher and higher, which results in the famous Berlin Wall. Now, if you go to Germany today, um, this is what it looks like. So they have a portion of the Berlin Wall still there that you can go and visit, but they actually have made it so that you know for sure where the Berlin Wall originally sat between the two different sides. And then something interesting as well when you go to Germany actually has to do with their stoplights. Uh, so basically, these are what are called Ampelmanns. And if you ever go to Germany, um, especially in Berlin, you will see giant Ampelmann gift shops. And basically what it is is this little figure. And Ampelmann is the guy on the left, in particular compared to the guy that's on the right. So what happened is, is that when the Berlin Wall went up, East and West Germany had very, very different um, versions of technology. One was on the Russian side and one was on the American side. And so what happened is, is that um, they had two different little crossing guys. So this is the guy that says, go walk across the street. This is the guy that says, stop. This one was in East Germany, East Berlin. And this one was in West, Ber uh, West Germany and West Berlin. Well, when the Berlin Wall fell, there was a problem. You see streetlights go out and they have to be replaced. Well, because the so-called democracy of West Germany won, they started to replace this guy, or excuse me, this guy, with this kind of boring figure. And so what happened is, is that the East Berliners were like, hey, you know, we've been here, we lived here, we grew up here, we want to sign for ourselves. And so because of that, they made it into German law that whenever one of these lampposts across the entire Berlin is replaced, they make it into this Ampelmann. And so uh, what happens is that this is a symbol and kind of shows like the unity and stuff like that in Germany. So if you ever go to Germany, Look at the signs. So you know that it's an old school sign if it looks like this. So this would be a West Germany. And if it's this, it's an East German one. And that's how you can tell the difference between these two sides when you go to Berlin. So fun fact. Uh, so Gold War in general. So you had two different sides. You had Truman over here on the left, Stalin over here on the right. Stalin does die, though, uh, early in the Cold War. And he is uh, replaced by Khrushchev, uh, which we'll talk about in two class periods. Um, but one of my favorite things to talk about is something that was kind of mentioned in you guys' homework assignment, which is the arms race. So the arms race was basically this bigger, badder, better weapons of being able to have the worst possible weapon. So the arms race and Cold War, those would both be star terms. And basically what happens is we massively increase our weapon production, as you can see in here, um, to be better than Russia. Now, when we dropped the atomic bombs, we assumed Russia had no idea that we had them. Obviously, that was false. In fact, they make an atomic bomb two months after we drop Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so because of this fear, they begin this massive arms race. And really, the biggest bomb that comes from this is a bomb called the hydrogen bomb. Now, both the hydrogen bomb and the drop bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they are both nuclear weapons. They are both about splitting the atom bomb. The difference is, is that while the atom bomb um, is fission reaction, the uh, hydrogen bomb is a fusion reaction, which ends up making it so much worse than it was before. So if you notice in this chart down here, this is itty bitty Hiroshima Nagasaki. These are our hydrogen bombs. 
So if you imagine Hiroshima and Nagasaki have 200 to 300,000 killed on impact, these are the biggest ones. So we're going to focus on Mike and Bravo because these are the ones that we're about to watch right now. Um, so Mike and Bravo are the ones that America drops first. So we detonate the very first hydrogen bomb. And we're going to watch that right now. And hopefully you can hear all the audio when I play it. Um, and if you're unmuted, hopefully, I don't know if you have a question or not. Uh, but anyways, so we're going to watch this. And I want you to think, how big is this? And if you guys remember when we talked about Los Alamos, um, they how they had like the animals and stuff like that that we talked about with the cows. They did the same thing here. So this is in the Bikini Islands in the Pacific. Um, they bought over 3,000 animals and put them on very, whoa, I don't know what you did. Uh, but they put it on various um, islands and then they wanted to see how many people would die. Uh, so this video, by the way, is being shot from 30 miles away. So that's kind of the impact that you can see. And this is original World War II footage that we're about to watch. So what you just saw, that was the original footage of the original hydrogen bomb. Now, the original hydrogen bomb was the equivalent of 15 million tons of TNT going off at one point. Um, the first five miles of the zone, which was in that really big... Colin, do you want to mute yourself? Um, let me see if I can. Okay. Um, There's a little button that has a microphone. Um, left. Okay. Uh, so basically everything in the first five miles of that giant plume was disintegrated upon impact and it had the same amount of heat and light as 500 suns. So we thought, you know, we've won, right? We have the biggest, baddest bomb. Well, until Russia comes up with their own a month and a half later. So a month and a half, they detonate what's called the Zara bomb. And that bomb was over 200 times larger than our bomb that we dropped as well. So when we watched this video, and basically what they did is they went to an area of Siberia where there was no people, and they detonated, they dropped this bomb to see what would happen. So what you're seeing, this is from over um, 50 miles away, is what they're videoing this from. The ground. The bomb had been given a parachute to slow its descent and give the crew more time to escape. They did escape, but only just. The plume rose right through the cloud layer and kept on rising. It flattened out when the cloud was 40 miles high. So if you can kind of see the impact of that, so their bomb went 40 miles high. Um, of this massive explosion. Again, all this video is being shot from 50 miles away. So obviously now we have two massive bombs um, that we could all die from. You might say, so what's going to happen though if, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know what happened. Let's try this again. Hold on. Uh, I have to restart this. Hold on. We're having issues. Technical glitches. Uh, so you might want to know, though, what would happen if we all died from a hydrogen bomb? So let's pretend that North Korea, whoever, is going to drop a bomb on this. So this is what happens to everybody when that occurs. Upon detonation, a thermonuclear bomb emits a stream of X-rays, infrared rays, and gamma rays. This is referred to as thermal radiation and is visible to the naked eye in the form of a brilliant flash of light lasting from one to ten seconds. It emits all of this x-radiation that's absorbed by the air around it. The outside of the air is burning. It's forming basically small. The nitrogen and the oxygen are reacting, turns brown, and so the light coming out actually goes down until that burns off and then it goes up again. The heat from the infrared rays will set people and buildings on fire. The x-rays will irradiate those closest to the explosion. The x-rays don't get very far. They're absorbed by the air. 
The air is then heated up by these x-rays to millions of degrees. The immense heat expands the air around the point of impact, creating a spherical shock wave and winds that can reach hundreds of miles per hour. And if it were a humid day, you'd be able to see that shock wave running along the ground and through the air because it would cause instant condensation of moisture in the atmosphere and you'd see sort of a white ghost of a shock wave traveling through the air. The wind from the shock wave extinguishes the fires caused by the thermal radiation, but will flatten everything in its path within a radius of two miles. You get the expansion out, but then the thermal plume of the bomb is rising. A mushroom cloud is forming. And so you get a counterflow, which when air flows up, it sucks things in. And so you get a reversal of the flow as things flow back toward the detonation center and rise. So we're all going to die if this happens. But hopefully we would be in the very first detonation because it would probably be a lot faster of a death compared to as you can see so this um thing that they did here is new york city so as you can see new york city was basically decimated in the first like two seconds so again we're fine hopefully but this would be what it'd be like if if a nuclear bomb went off as you can tell but here's the good news because i'm going to teach you how we can all survive this nuclear attack so in the 19 whoa in the 1950s uh, the U.S. government decided that they were going to help everybody survive these nuclear attacks. So they taught you something that was called duck and cover. And we're going to watch this adorable duck and cover video. And we're all going to learn. And then we're going to practice surviving a nuclear attack. Because if we're going to have a pandemic, we're probably going to be nuclear attacked soon. So we might as well just go ahead and prep for it. So we're going to watch this adorable video. And we're all going to learn how to survive from that. Maybe.
You might be out playing at home when the warning comes. Then be sure to get into the house fast, where your parents have fixed a safe place for you to go. If you are not close to home when you hear the warning, go to the nearest safe cover. Know where you are to go, or ask an older person to help you. You know the places marked with the F sign? They're safe places to go when you hear the alarm. If there is a warning, you will hear it before the bomb explodes. But sometimes, and this is very, very important, sometimes the bomb might explode without any warning. Then the first thing we would know about it would be the flash. And that means duck and cover fast, wherever you are. There's no time to look around or wait. Be like Bert. When there is a flash, duck and cover, and do it fast. Here are some older boys showing what to do if the flash comes when you are not in the classroom. This is what to do if you should be in a corridor. You duck and cover tight against the wall this way. Remember to keep your face in the back of your neck covered tightly. Try to fall away from windows or doors with glass in them. Then, if the glass breaks and flies through the air, it won't cut you. You might be eating your lunch when the flash comes. Duck and cover under the table. Then, if the explosion makes anything in the room fall down, it can't fall on you. Getting ready means we will all have to be able to take care of ourselves. The bomb might explode when there are no grown-ups near. Paul and Patty know this and they're always ready to take care of themselves. Here they are on their way to school on a beautiful spring day, but no matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover. Paul and Patty know what to do. Paul covered the back of his head so that he wouldn't be burned, and Patty covered herself with the coat she was carrying. They knew how to duck and cover they acted right away when the flash came. If they had been at this doorway when the bomb flashed, Paul and Patty would have ducked and covered this way, like this girl. Heavy doorways are a good place to duck and cover. She will be safer, too. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. a boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. Tony knew what to do. Notice how he keeps from moving or from getting up and running? He stays down until he is sure the danger is over. The man helping Tony is a civil defense worker. His job is to help protect us when there is danger of the atomic bomb. We must obey the civil defense worker. We must know how to duck and cover in the school bus or in any other bus or streetcar. Duck and cover. Don't wait. Duck away from the windows fast. The glass may break and fly through the air and cut you. Sundays, holidays, vacation time. We must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. This family knows what to do just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. So, the good news is, as we can see from here, uh, all we need is a newspaper, and we'll all survive. Now, obviously, is this actually going to save you? No, we'll all die. But it made a lot of Americans feel a lot better that there was something that they could do. So if you can tell the propaganda here of convincing people, yeah, we made one of the worst disastrous bombs in world history, but hey, you can survive too. So, um, to be able to practice, I thought we could all do a cute little air drill. So, here's what we're gonna do, and hopefully I can be able to pull this back up for everybody to see each other, I don't know. Maybe not. Okay, so, now that everybody can see each other again, hopefully, we are gonna practice an air raid drill. Now, here's what's gonna happen. You guys have all learned how to be able to do duck and cover. Now what you're going to do uh, is that you are going to, as soon as the air raid siren goes off, we're all gonna duck and cover and we're all gonna practice surviving. Now, some of you do not seem as excited as I expect you to. 
So pump up a little bit, get ready, and I'm watching you, so I would know whether or not it's going to be. Now, somebody did say, what about dropping and rolling? You don't need that. All that stuff you learned as a kid is useless. What's important here is you duck and cover, and then we'll all survive the nuclear bomb. Sound good? Okay, so pretend to be going about your day as a normal person, just hanging out, ready to go. And I got my newspaper. Oh, you got your newspaper. Oh, see, Jackson's totally ready to go. Perfect. Under the bed. Watch how quick this one is. Get ready. Three, two, one. Well, I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. You, <laughs> you don't know when the bomb's going to go off. We're safe now. Okay. So we're yeah, hanging the, out. The radiation can't put out we're again, we're feeding. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. Hanging out. La, 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 la. The radiation isn't legally allowed to penetrate because you tell it no. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Shout out to like the two people on this uh, one screen alone that didn't do anything. All right, well, now we know who survives and who doesn't. Okay. I like yeah, the one for literally, there was one like two people who were like this. Okay, well, you're going to be the first to die. So that's a personal problem. Well, well, in the case of nuclear radiation, wouldn't dying first be beneficial? Because then it's less pain. No, because if you duck and cover, you'll be fine. And for the person with their cat, you're going to be fine too, as long as the cat ducks and covers as well. So you should be just fine. And the cancer thing, we're not worried about that. All we care about is ducking and covering, and we'll be just fine. So, uh, oh, somebody... Olivia, hopefully your dog. Is that a different dog? How many dogs do you have? Yeah, it's the 50s. Okay. Uh, so you might say, obviously, like, that probably wasn't the most uh, effectual way of being able to actually survive. Um, so what are some other ways that people also wanted to be able to survive and be able to uh, do all right? So some of the ways that they were able to do that is um, basically through creating these bomb shelters. And if you live in a place in Salt Lake City that is prior to really 1965, you more than likely um, have some sort of a, a bomb shelter at your house. So the bomb shelters, the whole goal is that you could survive underground between three to five months would be the goal, although most people only had enough to survive about three to four days um, underground. If you've ever played the game Fallout, um, that's all what this is talking about is creating these nuclear shelters. Uh, so basically, people sold them, and I think the statistic is about one in four households in America had bought one of these bomb shelters um, to be able to survive in one of these nuclear attacks. So if you see, if you're driving along in Mill Creek and you see one of uh, these in the, I don't know why I'm pointing, you can't see me. Uh, if you're seeing in the bottom left right here, that's more than likely a fallout shelter. Um, I've heard a bunch of your families have made them into like wine cellars or food storage. Um, just remember, if we have a nuclear attack, that's what it's for. So make sure you have enough room for both your wine, your food, and shelter, and then you'll survive just fine. But maybe you say, what if I want to go a step further? Well, that's the video that I want to show you. You see, there are actually luxury bunkers that you can buy into, uh, and this is the one that's in Kansas. It's such a secret site that they actually can't reveal to you um, where it's at, but it is outside of Wichita, Kansas. Um, it is sold out, and I did hear an update when I was doing this yesterday that they said that right now 30% of their tenants have moved in permanently due to the current pandemic. So what would it look like today if you lived in one of these luxury bunkers that cost $3 million um, an apartment to be able to stay in one of these bunkers? When the world's about to Wait, end, does that have this is probably the last Hold place on. you go. However, if you want to hunker down in a bunker, survival condo, Wait, can you see this? Okay, there it is. I don't know why I was having problems. Let's try this again. It's you want to be, and flames. once you step inside those doors, well, you're not million. in Kansas anymore. We can go, go from the top to the bottom in 29 seconds. A luxury condominium complex in the middle of Glasgow, Kansas. Well, actually 201 feet below Glasgow, Kansas. <laughs> Each condo worth three million dollars. This is a high definition camera feed from upstairs, so you can tell what time of day it is, what the weather's doing, who's coming and going. Nearly ten years ago, Larry Hall purchased an old missile silo and turned it into a lavish complex for the wealthy who worry about doomsday. From walk-in closets 
full-size bedrooms and bathrooms, high-end appliances, and even stone fireplaces. Each condo is fit for an entire family to live like they do in the real world. The unthinkable is, well, has already been thought through here. For the families with small children, there's even a classroom for them to attend school each day. A grocery store, even a gym, a movie theater, and a dog park. The beach? <coughs> what? Yes. Oh, so, yes. So this. There's even an indoor pool with a slide. With all that stuff included, the monthly HOA fee is a mere $5,000. They come in and they can, you know, learn from, you know, some of the best, you know, how to safely handle a firearm that way. You know, in the event this place were ever attacked, we have to defend ourselves. We have, you know, You have means, your own little army. Oh, yeah. You need, you, you need to. The underground community can sustain itself. It includes a hydroponics room to grow their own food, a miniature hospital in case residents get sick. It even generates its own power. This is a computer that controls our five power sources. We're grid connected. That's what this one is. And that's diesel generator one, diesel generator two, our wind turbine, and then this battery bank behind us. Even if the world never comes crashing to an end, Paul says many of the owners will use the bunker to just get away from it all. For the now, I'm Annie Taylor. So, if any of you want a good Christmas present, you can buy into this. You can buy a half apartment, because I know that three million is a little steep. You can buy a half apartment for only 1.5 million. So maybe instead of going to like Harvard or something like that, you could consider this, which is a much better alternative, I would say. Um, but basically, and I watched like seven videos last night on this, trying to find the perfect one to show you. So some things that they did not show you in this of the other videos. So one thing that they pointed out is that if they, so the whole point of the bunker is they have enough supplies in there to sustain life for seven to nine years. And they pointed out that if they wanted enough toilet paper to sustain everybody for seven to nine years, it would take three stories of toilet paper. So instead they have $2,000 bidets. Uh, for their toilets instead and they're completely programmable and then in one of them they have an upgraded one that includes like an HD TV that comes out while you're going to the bathroom so if any of you want something to look forward to in life when you're a millionaire um, you can either donate to your teacher or you could buy one of these really fancy ones and it is sold out so they are making three more of them um, that you can have but I think it's 32 stories tall um, and every story is completely sold out. And hey, we can still have school. So that's cool. Um, but I did hear that a lot of people have joined it because of the pandemics and different things like that. So now you know. Um, so as we go through here. So basically, obviously, it's like a huge period of, of just communism. So make sure you know with the Red Scare, we just completely feared that we were all going to die. Um, and because of that, we feared communism. And we had this massive time period of paranoia where we all thought we were gonna die, we all thought the world was full of spies and different things like that. Um, so for example, uh, you had this guy named uh, Joseph McCarthy who was a senator and he famously went in front of the US Senate and he said, I have in my hand a list of 205 known communists in the State Department. And basically everyone thought, oh my gosh, like our whole government, like how far up does it go where these these communists? And every week he came out with new numbers. I know 4,000 names, 5,000 names, 10,000 names. And everybody feared even their postal workers were communists. Um, it did go eventually too far though because he accused the head of the US Army of being a communist, but it really caused a whole bunch of fear. Um, the Rosenbergs were two spies. Um, the guy, Julius, he basically uh, took a whole bunch of stuff from the Manhattan Project and gave it to the Russians. Both of them were tried and executed. However, uh, the female, the wife, is more than likely innocent and was unaware that her husband was a spy, um, but she was executed as well. Uh, even in Hollywood, people started to accuse that the movies you were watching were all communist propaganda, and it ended up resulting in 10 Hollywood producers and actors being arrested um, for what they did of uh, apparently portraying communism uh, in the media and different things like that. So in general, with foreign policy, a lot of this has to do with fear of spies. So the CIA gets created in order to find spies. So you might say, well, who cares about all these spies? Well, for example, in Berlin, there was this girl on the right, and she fell in love with the guy on the left. 
and they got married and they were dating and different things like that. Well, he started asking her because she was just a secretary in like the um, the West Berlin State Department. And she, he was like, hey, you know, you should work from home more. You should bring your work home. So she started to bring her work home. Hey, I'm curious about this part of West Berlin. You should bring that information home. And she gave all that information to this guy who was a spy. Well, what she didn't know is he was married to 52 women. And 52 women were all being played who were all these people in that were secretary, janitors, things like that. And basically what happened is they, uh, he took all that information, he gave it to the Russians, and he was a Russian spy. And a lot of these women had absolutely no idea. Um, if you have ever been huge into like Oxford and Cambridge, at Cambridge they recruited students to be spies. So they created these cool clubs that were like these elite clubs, so all these people would join. And these guys known as the Cambridge Four ended up becoming these massive Russian spies that stole all this information and gave it to um, the Russians during this time period. This is also the really cool spy era where they would take all these pictures. So, so if you ever heard of spy cameras and different things like that, um, or they would have all these different things hidden so that you couldn't be able to find it. And they were tracking you in the United States, Russia, Germany, everywhere because of this huge, massive fear going on in the Red Scare. Uh, even shoe cameras where if you tapped your heel, you would be able to take pictures of different things that you needed. All of this was processed on a micro dot. So if you notice, this is how small these micro dots are. So if you can see the inches right here, and all of this was information. It wasn't just other people. It was the United States, too. There were just spies everywhere, fearful of the Red Scare and different things like that. One of the most famous examples of oh, yeah. why not to take things from other people. Um, so this was actually a gift from the Russians to the United States State yeah. Department. They put it in their conference room, had it there for five years until they found out that there was a secret bug behind it. And they had recorded five years of top secret um, conversations in the U.S. State Department. Uh, so yeah, even to the Department of Elementary School students. Yeah, so it was just this crazy time when uh, all these were like spies and different things like that. Um, this was also the era of the space race. So basically the race between the two. So this is another really good example of trying to be bigger, better, badder than all the other people. By the way, the part of the reason science and education and science and math, so STEM stuff is so important, is because NASA sponsored it at this time to create better space race stuff. It's also the start of standardized testing. So you can thank all the SATs, ACTs, and Aspire. All that's thanks to the space race to get you smart enough to beat the Russians in space. Uh, now, me. yeah. Um, so that guy that had like 50-something wives, did yeah. he have a lot of kids? Uh, so no, they never hung out together. Um, he okay. always said that he was too busy. And that he had a really important job. So he, I, if I remember correctly, I read one source um, that said in a single day he visited 20 of his wives. Um, and neither of them had any idea of the other people. Um, so he was really, really good at, at playing it off. Um, and again, all these women. So the woman that I had in that picture, it's really sad. She always maintained his innocence. Um, and even when he went to, uh, he ends up getting captured, if I remember correctly, and traded in a spy trade between Russia and the United States. And uh, when he ended up getting put on trial, she showed up and said, there's no way he could have did, done this to me because I love him. And it was really sad. But as far as I'm aware, I don't think he had any kids um, because he said he was too busy for that. So, All right. Thank you. Yeah. That, I guess that's what happens when you have like 50 wives. Um, you don't have enough time to hang out together and make kids. Uh, so anyway, so with the space race, it was obviously this competition between the two to be bigger and better. So it's a great example of like technology and things like that advancing at the time period. Um, and all these people were invested of who is going to make it to the space or to space first. Now, I went to NASA a couple of years ago. This is Ms. Ray. I'm so cute. Um, from two years ago. And uh, this is in Houston. So if you ever go to Houston, you'll see all this really cool stuff that you can be able to see. Um, but basically, the very first thing that they did is Russia put up flies into space they wanted to see whether or not it was survivable um, in that environment and they launched this fly up into space and all the flies died um so they ended up losing i think it was two thousand flies um in the very first attempts to be able to put them up into space so then they switched to a monkey so once they had figured it out they switched it up and they put albert two up into the air this was the very first animal that did survive so he went up into the air and he survived all around so they had him in this little like cage thing they launched him up into space and it was just fine. He survived. He ends up coming back down and survives. This was by the United States as the very first animal to make it into space. Unfortunately for the monkey, though, they put him down 
because they wanted to give him an autopsy to see what the effects of space were on internal organs. Like, so yeah, so Albert the second dies. Sorry. Um, what, hap what, what happened? What happened to Albert one? Uh, you can assume what happened to Albert one. Uh, Albert one was in the very oh. first rocket that attempted to go into space and it exploded. Uh, I think it was about 10 seconds what after takeoff. So, what did they do with the bodies of the flies? Did they autopsy the flies? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not as genius about the flies as I am about the other animals. Uh, but if we want to talk about dogs, um, so Russia was very well known for, um, I believe they took around 300 dogs that were all um, like strays. And those are what they launched up into space. And so they launched up and the most famous one that successfully survives um, in terms of going up for Russia is Leica. And they actually have all these stamps and things like that. Are, this came out two years ago in memory of all those dogs that died. Um, Leica went up into space and was able to, this was the first time Russia was able to get past the atmosphere without it burning up. Unfortunately for Leica, they incorrectly put Leica into the, um, the space thing and it ended up suffocating Leica and Leica died. Um, not due to space, but due to the fact that they did not put the dog up into space correctly. Um, and this was, so this was what the little pod was. So what happened is basically, well, I'm not going to tell you, but it, this dog suffocated. I'm sorry. Sad things. Uh, so now we're going to put a human into space and Russia is going to succeed in that. So he ends up going up. He goes around the uh, world in, uh, for 24 hours, comes back, is the very first successful man in space. So now all of a sudden America says, well, we got to step it up and we got to be the first ones into space because Russia is going to win. And we can't let Russia win. They're the communists. So instead, we're going to put our own guy up. Well, this worked really great for about 12 hours until there was a malfunction in the spaceship and he had to come back down. So again, this constant competition between the two different ones. Well, in the end, as you know, we win technically according to America, the space race, because we're the very first people to put the man on the moon. Um, as you guys all know, you've all heard of like uh, the very famous Lance Armstrong. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yeah. Lance Armstrong was a guy that got... I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am going the best I can. So anyway, so what happens is, uh, not Lance Armstrong, my bad. Uh, but basically what happens is Neil Armstrong is going to be the very first man on the moon. Now, something interesting is um, there. this is the actual original place where they ended up uh, running this spaceship. And this little box right here was the only thing that you could communicate with the people in space. So one interesting fact as well about this too is that this little box was it. And then the computer system that ran that original flight into space um, could only run, so that entire thing to put up into space took four um, megabytes of data. A single phone, four? yeah, so four, and a single um, photo that you take on your cell phone is eight megabytes. So you can kind of see the huge massive difference, and then obviously we landed on the moon. So what is NASA doing today? Well, part of the problem is we borrow from Russia. So right now we don't have any space um, pods that can go up, so we have to borrow the Orion ships from Russia. It's 150 grand each way for one person to go up into space. That also includes trash to bring down. So instead, SpaceX is creating the Dragon Pod that will allow Americans to not have to pay to go up into space. We're also creating these really cool robots that are basically apocalyptic robots. These are uh, doctors. So in an apocalypse, they could come and save us all. And then we'll all be just fine. Uh, so they isn't can go... borrowing socialism? What's that? We borrow from Russia, but isn't that socialism? Uh, well, the only problem is, is that so to create this uh, dragon one, the reason SpaceX had to do it is it's going to cost, I think they said $700 billion to create the pod. So in theory, money-wise, it'd be better to pay for $150,000 one way than to spend all this money. So SpaceX um, ended up buying the rights to create the pod to be able to set up into space. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a couple other things really quick before we move on to Korea, which is the main, uh, my favorite thing to talk about in this whole thing. So the Iron Curtain, that's a star term. Um, that's basically the border in between communism and democracy. So a huge fear happened of Russia going into all these other countries. So Churchill said, we must create an Iron Curtain, which is the ideological barrier um, between basically communism and democracy. As you can see, the little eye right here is Berlin. Um, Russia creates all these little satellite nations. He they take control of this and they make all of these into communist nations. So the Iron Curtain becomes this huge fear of what's going on, what is Russia doing, um, and what should we be concerned about when it comes to Russia. So we decided that instead we're going to contain them. 
So that's their problem. All we're going to stop now is we're going to contain the communism and not allow it to go any further. So this is some of the review that you've already done. So Truman Doctrine, we begin to punch a, uh, put a whole bunch of money into Europe to be able to rebuild the economy. Um, the Marshall Plan ends up sending uh, billions of dollars to help rebuild the economy instead of causing it to become a post-World War II Germany, or post-World War I Germany, excuse me. Uh, Russia did decline that aid. Um, and rejected it uh, behind that iron curtain. The Berlin airlift was when we ended up as, again, as you learned this before, we get blocked off by Russia. Um, and so we begin to airlift a whole bunch of supplies into Russia. And that's where you get the famous candy bomber. So he's the guy from Ogden that uh, ends up creating the very famous candy bomber. And fun fact about Hershey's chocolate, Hershey's chocolate was failing miserably. Um, they were actually going out of business after World War II due to World War II rations. So instead, they donated one million chocolate bars to the U.S. Army to drop in the candy bombers. And it ended up becoming this really famous icon of these candy bars being dropped. And then it became the number one selling candy bar right after that. Now, one thing that you're going to want to know, so this is for everybody, is you're going to have an access code. This is going to encourage people to listen to the lecture before doing the quiz. So you need to write down the access code I'm about to give you. It is very simple. It is chocolate. Chocolate is the access code. So when you go to do the quiz, you get the benefit, because I'm going to get 10 messages that say, what's the access code? It's chocolate, because we're going to remember the candy bomber and Hershey's chocolate. Are Wait, is that? it all lowercase? All lowercase. All lowercase. All lowercase. Chocolate. How do you spell chocolate? <laughs> You're making me nervous. I don't know if I can spell it correctly. Is Google it Chocolate. and that'll Latte. help you. Chocolate. Okay. Chocolate. All right. So that's Chocolate. your uh, one for that. So let's get to Korea. And the reason I really want to talk about Korea is because I'm more going to talk about North Korea now. So just to let you know, time wise, um, we have about 20, 25 minutes left, just so that you guys know. Um, it depends on how much you guys want to talk about Korea now. So the Korean War is going to begin, but it's really because it starts with Mao Zedong. Remember this chart that we talked about before and the dude over here that kills everybody? Yeah, that's Mao Zedong. So he comes into power in China after World War II, and he begins to spread communist influence into Korea. So the all the communism begins to drip, 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 drip. And then it ends up causing the two sides to split at the 38th parallel. And make sure you know it splits at the 38th parallel. So basically to say the North is going to be communist, the South is going to be um, democratic, and this worked great for three months. And then after three months, North Korea invades into South Korea, and it begins the Korean War. Now, the, really, South Korea actually interpreted this as, for America, we interpreted this as the same thing as Germany invading Poland in World War II. Um, basically beginning another war. And again, we got to stop communism. So this really becomes the, one of the first major ones that we go into that was not a direct attack on the United States, but instead it was ideological to stop communism. So they invade into South Korea, and basically we go into the Korean War. Now part of this is because of a fear. If Korea falls, it's a domino effect. So this is actually Vietnam, which we'll talk about later. But imagine Korea right here. If Korea falls, then Laos falls, and Vietnam, then Taiwan then Korea again, Philippines, Japan, and all of these things fall because of Canada. communism. What's that? How do they make the leap from Japan to Canada? Um, I, I've never actually been asked that question before, um, but my assumption is that eventually, if you notice, it's going more and more east, and then all of a sudden it hits into the Canada the United States. That would be my assumption. Never been asked like that question. Huge, no, like all the ones before, like my I know. Never been asked that question. Okay, uh, so again, that spread or that fear of spreading in communism. Now, really quickly, you need to know about the Korean War. It was not a war. It was what is called a police action. A police action because America never declared war, um, because we couldn't declare war, it wouldn't have been justified. So instead, the United Nations declares war and we fight in a police action which is why it is never called a war. Um, that's why some states actually say that you don't have to teach the Korean War because they're like, we never went to war. And part of the reason we don't admit we went to war is because we, we didn't win. And we don't like to talk about wars we didn't win. Uh, so one thing really interesting about the Korean War, it was in the middle of winter time, so it was extremely cold and very mucky and awful um, and different things like that. And uh, it's part of the reason why you get these really famous photos in the springtime for example, of um, this like rain and stuff like this and this muck. And it's part of the reason why the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. is that image of the people in the ponchos um, because of it was so mucky. 
In terms of the American reaction to the war, almost everybody supported it because we wanted to stop communism. And again, that was our big thing. But a lot of people also said, are we not just doing what they're doing? So you can see right here, we're saying it's a peace movement where we're coming in with our tanks. Um, you have the UN uh, doing their police action, but you can see there's mounting casualties. There's hate for people, expenses. And a lot of people said, is this actually worth it to go into the war? Well, that's when Douglas MacArthur comes in. And Douglas MacArthur um, basically is the head of the U.S. Army in Korea. Well, he decides he's going to end this. You see, they are going to massively advance on the North, and they push the North, or the North Koreans all the way to the border. They are like weeks away from winning. But there's a problem. China says, now we're threatened by the United States. What if America now invades into China past the border of the Yule River? So instead, China declares war on the United Nations, and now China is in this war too. And remember, this is Mao Zedong. So Douglas MacArthur, to stop all of the Chinese is going to reveal a list of 30 to 50 targets that he is going to drop atomic bombs on for China. So imagine Hiroshima and Nagasaki times 30 to 50 on the border of North Korea and China. And it makes Douglas MacArthur look bad. This is actually a propaganda poster from only three years ago. Um, so not even that long ago of people fearing the fact that Douglas MacArthur was going to drop all these bombs. Well, what happens is Truman is not happy about that. So they have this huge public fight. I mean, it would go viral now if it had been today. And basically what happens is, is that they are going to have this massive public fight and Truman fires Douglas MacArthur, who was the hero. It actually ruins Truman's career because Douglas MacArthur comes home as a hero. And everybody said we should have dropped all the bombs on China and basically obliterated China with all of our atomic bombs. So Douglas MacArthur is gone and basically it ends in stalemate. So you need to know the war ends in a stalemate. Basically, neither side ends the war. We just signed an armistice. We said we're going to stop fighting, and we all left. We actually never signed a peace treaty between the two countries. North and South Korea just signed their peace treaty only two years ago between the two. Instead, it was a stalemate. It's part of the reason that we don't talk about the war, because we never won it. Basically, after the 18 months, we pull out, and that's the end of the war. So why do you want to care about this now? So what does Korea look like today? So this is the DMZ. So this is the border between North and South Korea. And it is heavily, heavily militarized. Um, the two different countries are not happy with each other, and it creates this very big stagnant. So, so over here is North Korea. This is going to be South Korea, and this is the famous line between the two. These blue buildings are, in theory, for peace talks. Um, they have only been visited three times in the last 55 years, which we will talk about in just a second. Um, so basically, you have this. Yeah, it's the, the most yeah, it's called the demilitarized zone, but it is the most militarized border between any nation. Um, so this is what it looks like today. So what happens, for example, if you want to escape from North Korea? So this was an incident that happened just a couple of years ago. A heroine escaped from North Korea. A young soldier risking his life, driving across the no man's land of the DMZ, crashing his Jeep and making a run for it. You can see him there just yards from the border as his fellow soldiers were firing on him. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Ferraditz, with the dramatic video of his escape. It happened near these iconic buildings straddling the border, the only place where soldiers from the north and south come face to face, those from the north just yards from freedom, a quest that nearly ended in death for this soldier. Behind the wheel of a military jeep, the 24-year-old barrels towards the south, his fellow North Korean soldiers in hot pursuit. There's landmines, there are multiple sets of fences, electrified fences, so it's not easy to get across. The jeep crashes into a ditch, the border so close, he breaks into a run as North Korean guards open fire, dozens of rounds aimed at the defector, five or six ripping into him as he crosses the dividing line. Critically wounded, these infrared images show what happens next. South Korean soldiers stay low, avoiding fire, crawling towards the defector. That is him lying still. They carry him out, away from the danger, and off to a nearby medical center. So altogether, um, he ended up being shot over 35 times, but he actually did survive. Um, so one of the things that happened, so he obviously gets pulled aside, and they were risking war by actually saving that guy. 
um, they could have very, very easily said that they weren't going to do that. So what is life like in North Korea? So I want to show you this video. and It's actually a video that was not made for history. Um, some of you might have seen these before. These are called 100 Years of Beauty. And they basically compare beauty um, in a country and they go decade by decade and be able to show it. So I want to show you this and I want you to think as you're watching this, what is the difference between North and South Korea when it comes to beauty? <laughs> and tell me when do they think the split happened? So you can see the split in the two different things. What event do you think would have caused that to have the screen like, split? Like around the 1950s, right? Yeah, and what happened in the 1950s? The Korean War. Yeah, the Korean War, right? So the Korean War splits the two. And then anybody want to go ahead and give me an idea? The South, what is the South um, kind of like? So what is the beauty style of the South? Or it's more Western. It's really Western. Yes, yeah, it's really similar to America, right? So you can yeah. see all the trends that are going on. What about the North? It's more focused it's on like, like the America. military. Like even the women join the military, so it's like simple. Yeah, so it's very much like militaristic. Does it really change? Um, no, very no, it, it's very <laughs> blocked <laughs> off. <laughs> which is compared to like. 1980s South Korea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so you can see basically that North Korea is very stagnant. And part of the reason that we know that they're stagnant actually can be for IP addresses. So every single one of us, including right now, we all have an IP address. So if I really wanted to, which I won't, um, I actually have access to the IP addresses when you go in here. So that's how people can track you, which is why if you put something, so for example, a couple of years ago, uh, or actually this like six months ago, there was a guy that lost on Fortnite. And so against this kid, so he messaged him on uh, Xbox and said, I'm going to come to your school and shoot up the school and kill you because you cheated or something like that on Fortnite. They tracked his IP address and they found him. And you hear those stories all the time where like there was a guy that, for example, was sexually assaulting a woman on Xbox Live and they were able to go capture that person and arrest him and he is, he's in jail right now. So we know IP addresses, though, that every IP address is something that connects to the Internet. So, for example, my um, I have to be careful so it doesn't talk, but like my Alexa, that is going to um, end up having its own IP address so they can track it. So in the United States, there's actually four IP addresses for every human in the United States. So that shows how much Internet stuff that we have. Uh, anybody have any okay. guesses of how many IP addresses might be in North Korea? One. One. Okay, so we have one. Five. Five. I don't know. IPv4, I'd like 100. 100. Possibly. So all together in the country, so they have 19 million people, they have um, 1,100 IP addresses. So out of all that people, there's only 1,100 that connect to the internet. And more than likely, those are government um, sponsored things. I'm sure if it was anything else, then I can guarantee that it's contraband. Uh, so what? Oh, so. Here's what I wanted to show you with this. So these are actually airlines to and from. So the only country that you can get a, a flight for uh, to North Korea is from China. You have to have like official business to be able to go on these flights. Uh, all of their planes are from the 1960s. So this is one of their planes. So you can actually notice how old it is. It is the only one star uh, airline in the world. And uh, the only thing they got more than one star, they got three stars on appearance of their flight attendants. So that's the only thing that they had is a little bit higher. Um, one of the requirements when you fly to and from North Korea is you have to read their newspaper. So they give you a, a thing of the Pyongyang uh, Times. 
and you are actually quizzed on it when you leave. And if you did not read it, you can be arrested for it. And if you do not pass the quiz, you can be arrested for it. So for those of you who don't like high stakes testing, um, that's a little bit more high stakes compared to what we have here. Now, one thing you might notice in all these photos is like this mist right here. Anybody have any guesses of what that mist is? Is it smoke? It's not smoke. Think of like old mm. stuff. May I have any guesses? So this, so this is air conditioning. So back in the olden days, your air conditioning unit would work by water vapor. So the entire cabin is filled with this water vapor that they have to, so you can see like their faces and stuff like that, they have to drip it off um, because it is so old school. This, by the way, is their airport. So this is on a busy day in the middle of the day of what their airport looks like. Um, and you might say, well, who cares? Like you, you don't fly and stuff like that. Well, you do. Um, and part of this has to do with the fact that they are so restricted. I'll talk about the what happens if you go to North Korea. Um, there is a lot of propaganda, for example, that it goes on in North Korea. Um, so back in the 1990s, there was a massive, massive famine um, that happened. So this is how much Americans eat on average every single day. This is how much a North Korean person eats. Um, and that includes today as well, but this was especially in the 1990s. That is actually less than um, a Big Mac, and it's worth about one and a half of the hot and spicy McChickens from McDonald's. Um, is about how much they were eating per day in North Korea. And it resulted in this massive famine throughout the country. Uh, obviously, though, North Korea is not going to say that, right? They're not going to say that they have all this massive famine. So instead, they have propaganda. Look how much food all these wonderful people have and how much they can have and different things like that. And part of the reason you can see this, too, is that these were official photos that were released in the there was a famine about three years ago. And you can see all this is like luxury foods and snacks and candies and chocolates and, and cookies. And that's all propaganda. This is all published to show, actually, we are pretty wealthy and we are pretty well off. We don't have a famine, we promise. By the way, back in the 90s, one in three North Koreans died um, during that famine as well. So another great example happened at the Winter Olympics. So what they did is they hired 110 cheerleaders that were going to cheerlead the North Koreans there. So we're going to watch this and see. Um, by the way, I always get people ask, how are these people chosen? These were all people who graduated from a university. They had extensive background checks. And let's just say that there are people there um, to make sure that you do what you're supposed to do at these Olympics. <laughs> propaganda, right, of showing this off. Now, I will say that they did do interviews with the cheerleaders. Um, the guy that was on the left here that seems like he doesn't want to be there, um, he actually was like their handler. So he was right next to them whenever they did interviews and they talked about how great North Korea was, how wonderful it was. Um, I will say four of them went missing. I shouldn't say went missing. They were sent home according to North Korea and they did uh, drop off a couple of those. Who knows what that means? Um, but North Korea did say that there were four people that had to come home due to family issues. So you can take that as you want um, from what happened right there in North Korea. So here's my question for you. Did anybody watch this movie a couple years ago called The Interview? Unmute yourself if you oh. did this and say yes. No. Yeah. 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 Yes, I've seen it. Okay, a couple people. All right. So here's the good news. If you watch this, you basically contributed to almost a nuclear war between the United States and North Korea. So let me explain what happened. Mm. So this movie, if you don't know, it's a, a comedy film. It's rated R, so you shouldn't have watched it anyways because none of you are 18 yet except a few of you, okay? But basically in this whole story, they are going to go and they are supposed to assassinate uh, the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. And it's this big R-rated comedy and different things like that. Well, this trailer comes out back in like June 
And North Korea says, as you can see right here, we will go to war. And then nothing happened. So everybody forgot about it because the movie was supposed to come out on Christmas Eve. Well, that's where it gets very... Well, let me just, like, wait, don't... Something. Let me let me tell a story. It's a good story. Okay. So right. here's what happens. All of a sudden, there is a Sony hack in November. So a really long time past June. And a bunch of movies that not a lot of people can... It's so like Annie 2, for example, came out. And it gets leaked. And Sony comes out and they're like, oh, sorry, guys. Like, we... We had this little hack, you know, we'll fix it. And nobody thought anything about North Korea until this happened. The day after they made the statement saying, oh, shoot, like, you know, we got hat. A lot of Sony employees showed up the next day to this on all of their computers. And that's when they found out they had legitimately been hacked. Now, the Sony hack actually has its own Wikipedia page. If you want to go watch it, it's one of the craziest hacks in American history because of what it revealed. So basically what happened is that all these emails and all these documents get revealed. So for example, um, and the FBI, by the way, did end up concluding that it was North Korea. North Korea has denied it. However, there's a lot of evidence it was North Korea. And then they basically in January said, well, you know, if you hadn't released that movie, and we'll talk about what happens to the movie in just a second. So what did it reveal? Well, first, it revealed basically all of the private documents. So if you notice right here, it included uh, the entire, all the passwords for every single login, all the logins as well. Also on this, um, it also included a document that had all of the insurance claims by everybody in the entire company, including people, for example, that it said they had a miscarriage, people that it said that they had um, gotten like vasectomies, people that it said for instance that they had cancer that was um, not out in public. And all this private information was published out onto the internet. You can see right here, YouTube login passwords. Um, they ended up stealing over half a million login passwords um, to be able to get onto that as well. So what else did it reveal? Do you guys remember we talked about the bucket list family and how all of a sudden people found out um, that they were really rich? It happened from there as well. Um, like I talked about before, they went on to, so this is Alpha Bay, which is um, basically a place where they put a whole bunch of hacked stuff. And they ended up releasing all of that hospital information, all the private information, all the doctors, where they lived at, you can see right here, social security numbers, all of that was published online as well as on Reddit. And then it got worse. So in particular, the celebrity impact. So some, some things were funny. So for example, they found out uh, 11 very famous actors and actresses, including Tom Hanks, including all these other people, um, what they went under alias wise. So people found out that they had been secretly staying at hotels and things like that. You're like, oh, well, that's no big deal. It gets worse. So for example, and I apologize for the bad language on this thing. I apologize. So First, Kevin Hart was in a film with Sony back in 2014. Uh, he had requested $1.2 million to be able to um, actively promote the film on his social media, or he said he wouldn't promote the film. As you can see right here, this is what was said in an email from the CEO to another CEO about what Kevin Hart was um, because of that decision. Uh, basically, you can see Angelina Jolie here, and I'm not going to read it all, but it basically said that Anna jo Angelina Jolie was, as you can see, a minimally talented, spoiled brat um, and all these different things. Uh, Obama, they ended up talking about how they were going to go to a meeting with President Obama at the time. And somebody said, what movies did you suggest for Obama? And the CEO responded with 100% uh, African-American themed movies and said, I wouldn't be surprised if he watches anything else because he's black. And then other things as well that they revealed too, they revealed all of the salaries of every employee that works there. And they revealed that out of the 21 people who make over a million dollars, only one of them was a female. And they also revealed in there as well, an email back and forth between people that said they weren't going to tell the one female that she's the only one that doesn't make, um, that she's the only one that makes over a million dollars and that they didn't want to tell her it was because she was a female. Uh, Katniss Everdeen, so if you know anything about her, so she ends up winning Best Actress and she was in a uh, movie called American Hustle. Um, there were two, four leads, there was two males, two females. The two males were paid nine million, the two females were paid seven. And in uh, two emails between CEOs, um, somebody said, I'm concerned that people might worry that we are paying the females less. And the two male CEOs responded and they said, who cares, they're just females, they won't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So all of those came out in that Sony hack as well. Oh, and by the way, one more thing that happens with this Sony hack. Um, so basically what happened is they pulled the interview and they said they weren't going to premiere it in any place. Um, then they came out and said, well, we're not going to bow to terrorists, so we're going to release it on YouTube. 
Then they decided they were going to release it on Netflix. And then what they did is they chose one movie theater in every state. Ours was up in Ogden to premiere that movie. Um, and they held it, but the FBI was there. I know somebody who went to that and they said that they all had to be like sniffed for bombs because uh, North Korea had said they were going to bomb all the theaters and they didn't. So interesting fact. Uh, now, how much do they hate America? Well, they hate America a whole bunch. Um, these are actually two propaganda posters from only two years ago um, of hatred between the Americans. As you can see, we kill babies and throw them down wells, and then we uh, they want to come and bomb the United States. Um, part of this is because of a massive massacre that happened during the Korean War where we killed what we thought were North Korean communists, um, but it actually was several innocent villagers, about 700 innocent villagers. Because of that, they have increased their absolute hate for us. So what happens, for example, if you go over there and you are put into jail? Um, well, it's not fun. In fact, uh, basically, it's extremely graphic what they do to you. So you can see uh, they cooked a prisoner's baby and fed it to their dogs. There's a lot of sexual assault in North Korean prisons. Um, if you want a really graphic one as well, a uh, woman who got pregnant from these sexual assaults, they would take a board and put it on her stomach and then put two people on each side of the board and push it down back and forth until the ribs crush through the uterus and kills the kid. Um, there's other things that they do as well. Uh, for example, actually, um, before I show that, I want to talk to you about this. Uh, this is an American kid that went to North Korea. If you go to China, there's a whole bunch of um, places that will advertise getting you into North Korea. He went into North Korea and he uh, allegedly stole a propaganda poster off of the wall. Um, and what happened is that he was arrested. He basically begged for his entire life. He ends up actually being returned two years ago. So he, this was back in, I think it was four years ago. Two years ago, they contacted him the United States and said they want to give him back in a prisoner exchange. We gave them $1.2 million in exchange for him, except he was in a coma. And they actually estimate that he had been in a coma for more than likely the entire time that he was in North Korea. And he ended up dying two weeks after he came back. When they opened up his stomach as an autopsy, they actually found worms in his stomach that have not been seen in the United States since the 1850s. Um, and basically his entire body was filled with these worms and things like that that was going on as well. Um, he made a very famous public apology where he admitted to doing it and he admitted to stealing it as a North Korean or as an American spy. Um, that was the last known video that we have of him alive. Um, other than that photo that I showed you before of him being taken back by the United States. Um, but in general, it's really bad. I'm going to show you this one video and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, but this is what would happen if, for example, that if you were in a North Korean prison. <laughs> Mr. Kim Gwang Il described how the police officers interrogating him propped him up in the pigeon torture position. In this exposed position, his chest was beaten until he vomited blood. In addition, he was subjected to the motorcycle torture and plane torture, where he was forced to assume extremely painful stress positions involving the prolonged extension of his arms until he collapsed. When they were not being interrogated, prisoners had to stay the entire day in their cell on a kneeling position with the head to the ground. Sixty or seventy people were kept in a cell designed for fourteen to seventeen people. At night, people had to take turns lying down while others in the cell were standing. This led to extreme exhaustion among the prisoners. Mr. Kim described how guards had the right to beat or otherwise torture them at any point including for trivial matters such as snoring while sleeping. Mr. Kim Gwang-il testified that the prisoners starved as they only received 80 grams of bad quality food per meal. They fed us some things that not even the pigs would eat, like for example rotten cucumber. Boiled rotten cucumber was given to eat, and if we refused to eat that, we would be punished. Mr. Kim added that prisoners became so desperate that they hunted and ate the snakes that lived on the prison's premises. According to Mr. Kim Gwang Il, there were hundreds of deaths during his two years and five months at Ordinary Prison Camp No. 12. Mr. Kim was himself involved in the disposal of the bodies of over 100 prisoners. The bodies were collected in a storeroom where they were often eaten by rodents or rot in the summer heat. When enough bodies had piled up, they'd be heaved on a large cart and driven up into the mountains where they were burnt. 
So I oftentimes hear people say like, well, that's obviously a problem. We should do something. But the question becomes, what, what do you do? Um, that's where you hear people say like, should we nuke North Korea? Should we uh, invade them? Should we assassinate their uh, Kim Jong-un, the second? Uh, what should we do? And so the problem is, is, is obviously there's a lot of human rights violations, but what is America's responsibility in each of those? Um, in terms of today, there's obviously been a huge uh, big thing that happened. This was two years ago. So basically, uh, they decided to come together and sign an official peace treaty and actually officially end the Korean War after 55 years. Now, the famous incident um, is basically where he is going to step across into South Korea. And that was the first time um, the leader of North Korea has stepped into South Korea since 1951. Um, and it became a really monumental event. So we're going to watch that monumental event right now. Well, this huge moment. Uh, we believe that uh, Kim Jong-un might be in that group of people there heading down these steps now uh, towards the South Korean President Moon Jae-in for this meeting at Panmun John House, which is actually in, and you can just see Kim Jong-un there behind uh, that uh, group of security guards. There he is more prominently uh, stepping down the hopes of so many people riding on this meeting. This is the man who's uh, been, been threatening to wipe out cities in the US and wipe out parts of Japan and South Korea in recent months and now he's walking down these steps to shake the hand of the South Korean president. So many people hoping this meeting will lead to substantial change and a deal uh, which could end up with the denuclearization of North Korea. But having said that, uh, there are people urging caution on both sides. So we might bring in uh, John Blaxland now from ANU. John Blaxland, uh, that, that uh, handshake is taking place as we speak. How significant is this moment? Oh, it's a, a groundbreaking moment, Joe. There's no question this is a very significant event. Uh, the hopes are high across the world that this will be. And you have to remember, when he stepped across, that was not planned. And the fact that he had stepped across was huge. And people um, were crying. I remember this happened actually when I was teaching A-Push two years ago. Um, multiple students in my class were crying who were Korean because this was such a big, big moment. Now, in the end, uh, they did come together with peace talks. Uh, for the first time since 1951, and it did end up resulting in the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So basically, both sides agreed to no longer have any nuclear weapons. Uh, now, part of the reason why the summit ended up occurring because they did know that they were detonating some sort of bombs. How we know that is because we look at earthquake monitors that have been solved since the 2014 um, since the 2014 tsunami, and we know that there were earthquakes that were zero depth. And when an earthquake registers at zero depth, it means that there's something that went off on the surface level that resulted in that quake, um, which uh, it's not an earthquake, but it's a bomb going off. Um, so we knew that they were doing that and different things like that, but they did agree to denuclearize. Whether or not North Korea actually did is obviously up to debate. Um, they also agreed to open the borders. So they have started family reunification between the two countries as well. Uh, so what is North Korea? So again, these are some really good um, cartoons that are kind of showing this as well of just general opinions about North Korea, of what the two different sides end up having. Um, a lot of people end up saying, again, that North Korea is this very much this hidden entity that we don't know obviously a lot about. Um, but then as well, another concern comes, what about the United States? So this is how far the distance is between each of the different areas. So we're in this 10,000 uh, to 9,000 kilometer range right here in Utah. What does that mean for us? Well, what happens if a bomb comes off? So for example, uh, there was in Hawaii where they thought uh, a person accidentally pressed the wrong button and it resulted in them believing a nuclear bomb was coming. So what if it were to come? So here in the United States, if it were to come to Utah, it would take approximately 11 minutes to get there. It would take about six minutes to get to Hawaii. In theory, we have several anti-nuclear missile defense systems along the coast, in particular of California, that would shoot that down. Uh, it would then cause fallout into the Pacific Ocean. It would probably kill all sea life in the Pacific, but we would all live. Um, and they have practiced that on fake bombs, but it has never been used in a real bomb situation. So we just um, have no idea. And in terms of today, this is actually something that happened about three days ago. North Korea did receive notification from Trump 
that he was willing to help them in their fight against the coronavirus. And uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un have had a better relationship than other presidents, but it's also obviously an extremely tense relationship. Sometimes they love each other and they're really good friends, and sometimes they despise each other and say we're going to invade the country and bomb them all. So it's really like kind of a hectic thing. And that is, that is it. And we went 10 minutes over. I'm so sorry. Um, but really quickly, as a quick overview before I stop and um, you guys can leave and you can ask questions or different things like that. So the FRQ practice quiz. So here's how it works. So this practice quiz is going to have six questions. So there's three SAQs. Um, based on what I'm hearing, most of us believe that it's going to be SAQs for the AP exam. Uh, so more than likely, it'll be three to four SAQs. And these are the ones that most people are saying are going to be it. Um, they've been doing some teacher lectures and all the teacher lectures. I actually took two of them and put them onto this SAQ practice. So I can assume that's going to be the format. But we don't know what the format is. So I'm also including two hip analysis. One, you choose whatever you want, one of the four letters. And one of them, you only do contextualization because we're practicing context because who knows, they could do an LEQ or a DBQ. We just have no idea. The last one is lecture questions. So if we're watching this lecture, I'm going to ask you three questions that if you watch the lecture should be easy. And it's not as similar to the extra credit that's on the test, but this time it will be four credits. It's worth the same amount as an SAQ. Um, and then here's all the possible ones. And again, your access code down here is that chocolate one um, for you to be able to access the quiz. So from there, that was really long. Okay. Anybody have any questions, comments, wanting to know about the class? Um, for the FRQ quiz, okay. the notes, wait, can you hear me? Yeah, so for the FRQ quiz, and I put it on there, so here's basically what it's, it's over, is the two assignments that you had for this week. So the origins of the Cold War, the 1950s, life in the 1950s assignment, and then our lecture today. Okay. Is what it's over. And then Sarah, did you have a question? You were holding up notes, so I wasn't yeah. sure. Uh, it, I just asked about what kind of this meant, but you just answered it, so. Okay, okay. perfect. All right, anybody are else? Still sure, are we still sure about the AP test date? Is there a possibility it could get nuked? All right, so here is, okay, this is insider stuff. So I'll be spreading this around. Because I read the email that was sent to you guys about the AP exam, and it was actually much less than what we know about the AP exam. Um, so here's some insider stuff that actually happened today. So I did not get selected, but 20% of all the AP teachers were sent a survey. And that survey asked what teachers believe should happen uh, with the AP exam. And what that survey resulted in is, and I did not get it but i saw the screenshots because we as teachers do exactly what you guys do when it's supposed to be private information we screenshot everything and then send it to everybody so what the survey said is the first question is out of these options what would be your first and second choice for the ap exam so they're giving two ap exam dates you get to choose what they are so if you want to take the later exam you can take the later exam if you want to take the exam in may then you take the exam in may um, so the days that they gave started on May 11th and ended on uh, June 20th. So what we can assume is that the two dates, one of them will start somewhere around May 11th. So it's about three days after our original AP exam date. And the last day is probably going to be, in my opinion, the week of June 11th, which is the last week, Monday through Friday of June, is what I would assume it's going to be. So I would say that probably one exam date is going to be either the week of May 11th or the next week of May 19th. And the second exam date will be probably around June 10th-ish or sometime in that week. I don't know if they're going to do where one day is APUS, one day is this. I don't know if they're going to say there's going to be um, a really big, uh, I don't know if they're going to say here's the week do all your AP exams this week. I don't know what they're going to say. Um, we find that out next Friday. So um, the other question that was asked as well is, would you prefer to add period eight onto the AP exam? Which I don't think that's gonna happen, so I wouldn't worry about that. And then um, the other question that was asked too is, did you completely finish it? And then the last one is, what are your thoughts? And a lot of teachers had a lot of thoughts, but at this point, it's not gonna change. 
Um, I think the only other question I've massively heard from people is, are schools still going to actually accept this? Um, as And everything I have heard is yes, is that they are going to, because previously in smaller circumstances, so for example, when Hurricane Katrina hit and schools were out for half the time, New Orleans schools received a shortened AP exam and they received AP credit for it. So that's what I would assume is probably going to happen. Does anybody have any other questions about the AP exam or the format or anything like that? So are these going to be proctored online? Like the tests are on paper? Mm -hmm. So it's online. Yeah. Oh, so right. what I'm hearing is it's going to be probably on AP Classroom. So okay, luckily, we have experience with that. We know the format. Next Friday, they're going to release all of the AP free responses, which um, once we know the format, it'll be a lot easier for me to assign things because I have no idea what it's going to be. My guess is four SAQs because one I did, so secret information, um, there were colleges that sent things to the college board that said, how am I supposed to give people credit when they're only being tested on periods one through seven and also on such a small amount of time, which is why I don't think it's an LEQ and why I don't think it's a DBQ because those only test one time period unless they do something crazy like last year they had an experimental DBQ that had a 200 year time frame. And it was innovations in technology from 1800 to 2000, which I think would be a horrible oh, idea. So I think it's going to be all SAQs, if I were to guess. I think it's going to be four okay. SAQs. That and SAQs. you'll see the format that I put on there because in these like teacher lectures, which students can attend to, but during those lecture periods, um, they have given us SAQ examples and all of them were SAQs. They haven't given any FRQ example or LEQs. They haven't given any DBQs. They've done no HIP analysis. They've only given them SAQs, which is why I'm assuming it's going to be four SAQs, if I were to guess. Oh, Wait, how long okay. is the actual test? Like, I think they said like 45 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Like 49 minutes? 45 minutes. No, right. Like the original test. Like if, there uh, was no if, there, if we were doing the original exam, okay. it's three hours and 40 minutes long. So they shortened it to 45. Yeah, which is was a That's huge shock to everybody. Matter. And a lot of people have asked, can you choose? So either I take the regular exam or this adjusted exam. 